Um, so apologize not uh, seeing you guys as much today up front here and making Malachi almost lose his voice. But uh, what are brothers for, right? I have been trying to get the um, team assignment kind of fixed. So there is an optional team assignment this evening, and it was not quite in the shape that we wanted it in. So I've been kind of reworking that extensively um, so that hopefully you will have a smooth experience going through the team assignment and the TAs will have a smooth experience helping you with that. So I have not uh, just been slacking off, but I've been working on something else course related, I promise. Okay, so um, we're going to just finish, I guess we just probably have time for maybe this lecture and that's probably going to be the end and we'll move on to um, actually continuing the practical alignment exercises tomorrow. We'll see how long this takes, but just going to do a quick intro to some of the concepts surrounding uh, alignment. So specifically, um, or actually generally, alignment is really a common feature of bioinformatics and genomics analysis. Um, and this is like a very common workflow, right, where you have like phase zero, generate your sequence data, get raw fast cues, and then the most common thing you do is some kind of alignment, alignment to a genome, alignment to a transcriptome, and then commonly you'll do quality control. And then in the green boxes are all the different paths you might go down, like peak finding or quantifying transcripts like we're going to do, or finding different kinds of variation and so on. And then that, of course, feeds into your analysis and interpretation and hopefully cool new discoveries. So how does alignment work? Um, alignment is, you can kind of think of it as like fitting individual pieces or reads into the correct part of the puzzle. And here the, the reference genome, the human genome or whatever your reference genome is, is kind of like the picture on the box that helps you figure out which piece goes where. Um, and then there are the possibility of kind of imperfection, how the pieces fit together relative to the reference or between multiple samples that can give you an idea about variation. Uh, if you don't have a reference genome, then um, your workflow looks totally different. Um, I highly recommend you get one if you can. They're a big help. Uh, so RNA-seq alignment challenges, um, this is still true to some extent. They're, they can be computationally um, costly. Um, you have the extra complexity relative to DNA alignment that um, you may have introns. So right, you may have splice data and you might have to make a choice about whether to align to the genome with a, like a splice aware aligner or um, sort of create a spliced reference of the transcriptome and align directly to that. And um, you might wish that you could just align your data once and be done with it, but that's generally not how it works in bioinformatics or genome analysis. You typically find yourself doing alignment over and over again with slightly different parameters or different software, depending on your goals. In terms of RNA-seq, historically, there were three major alignment strategies. Um, so there was a de novo assembly, um, which is really for the case where you don't have a reference genome or maybe a transcriptome, and you're trying to like infer the transcript structure directly from your data. Um, and we have a module that we won't get to in this version of the course that, that we do in longer versions that actually introduces to some tools um, for transcript assembly. Uh, you can align to the transcriptome, or you can align to a reference genome with a splice aware aligner. So we're going to do the third approach, which is probably the most common approach now. In terms of which strategy is best, uh, it sort of depends. So as I mentioned, if you um, don't have a reference genome, uh, you may have uh, no choice but to do a de novo assembly approach. Um, there are also is some possibility that there's like complex variants or haplotypes that would be missed using a reference genome approach where the reference genome itself can't like fully represent that complexity, right? Like most non-graph based reference genomes are just like one single representation of like an individual or a or simulated individual. So in cases where there's like complex structural variation or a lot of like small variation packed together, 
um, that might cause you problems that you could get around with using a de novo assembly approach. Um, aligning to the transcriptome, um, if you have short reads, this, this used to be the preferred path, like if you had less than 50 base pairs. Um, that is not as common now, so most places are generating 100 plus reads, and so this is not as common of a strategy. It also relies on knowing the, the sequence of, of transcripts, of having a known transcriptome. Uh, aligning to the reference genome is kind of for all other situations, and now, as I said, most situations. Uh, it doesn't necessarily rely on known transcripts, although you can use known transcript structures to guide the process. Um, it can still allow for discovery of new transcript structures from um, like a, a reference guided approach. Uh, and there are uh, multiple splice aware aligners that allow you to do this aligning directly to the reference genome. So there are many aligners. Um, we're going to introduce you to one or two or maybe three in this course. There's dozens of others. Um, and this is kind of like a history of various aligners. I think it's too small for you, but HiSat, which we're going to use, is on there somewhere. So should I use a splice aware or unsplashed, unspliced aligner? Um, we kind of talked about this. Um, the fragments that we're sequencing represent mRNA with the introns removed. Um, but we're usually aligning these reads back to the reference genome, again, unless you have short, less than 50 base pair reads you're probably going to use a splice aware aligner. And specifically in this course, we're going to introduce the HiSat aligner. So HiSat is one of these splice aware aligners. Um, it does require reference genome. It, it's very fast uh, and it's a very robust and well developed and maintained tool, which is one of the reasons we, we chose to use it. It uses uh, a kind of complicated indexing scheme based on the Burrow Burroughs Wheeler transform and FM index. And it does multiple, it uses multiple types of indexes for alignment. And we're going to kind of walk through some examples just conceptually of how this works. There are several papers that describe the algorithm in like it's all its gory details, um, which I encourage you to check out if you want to understand it at a deeper level. But basically, it, what it does is create, we're going to build these indexes. You create a genome wide index and then a large number of smaller local indexes. Uh, and then you kind of do this iterative uh, alignment strategy again using those two indexes. It also tries to um, account for, or it has the option to account for known polymorphisms and known transcript structures. So it, you can feed it information about um, known uh, exon exon junctions and, and SNPs. So as I mentioned, it uses this hierarchical indexing algorithm and then several adaptive strategies uh, based on the position of a read with respect to splice sites. So we're gonna look through some examples of what I mean by that. Uh, it has, has this multi-step process where you first find candidate locations across the whole genome, um, mapping part of each read using this global index. And that usually gives you one or a few candidate locations for your read as you try and figure out where it aligns to. And then you switch to a local um, alignment using these local indexes. So it takes the genome, it makes one big global index, and then it makes 48,000 local indexes and um, uses them both to come to a final alignment. And then for paired reads, each uh, pair or each mate is mapped separately. Uh, and if a read fails to align, then the line, the alignment of its mate can be used to anchor it and sort of re recover that uh, unaligned mate. So here are some examples to kind of hopefully make this a little more clear. So what we're looking at here are two exons from um, chromosome 22. So there's an exon one, there's a relatively small uh, intron. And then there's another exon. And we're going to look through examples of how this aligning strategy works for three different kinds of reads. So um, for the read that is just entirely contained within an exon, uh, for a read that slightly spans from one exon into another, uh, and then another that is sort of more evenly split across two exons. So 
So for this first example, this is kind of the simplest example. We align this first read. Um, so remember the read is in red here. We line the first read using this global index. And this part is kind of the time consuming part. Um, so what we're basically trying to do is find a like a kind of a sub alignment. So it looks to build um, a match of at least 28 bases long. So once it finds a unique place in the global index where this blue 28 base pair sequence matches one or more places, it then switches um, to the local index. Uh, actually, first it attempts an extension. So before, without even like trying to get clever, it just says, okay, I know where these, I found this 28 base pair match to this particular part of the, the genome using the global index. The first thing I'm gonna just try and do is just straight extend it. Like if the read belongs here, then the 29th base should be what I expect based on the reference and the 30th base and so on. So it just tries this extension step. And if it matches, it matches. And it's like, great, I, I figured it out kind of where I thought it belonged using this 28 base segment and I extend it and it all looks good. The read must belong here. So that's kind of like the simplest possible situation. If you happen to span uh, an intron, of course, it gets a little more complicated. So again, you start with this um, for the second read. Um, we have this problem where there's actually just like a very short segment on the other side, right? So that's going to be a little bit more challenging. So the first 28 bases on the right end of the read map, again, we find this unique match to um, the global index. And then we again uh, do this extension phase. So the, the purple. And so we're just checking to see if the read matches to that place that we've we positioned ourselves using the global index search. And it, it works up until like the 93rd base or something like that. But then you start getting mismatches. It hits this intron and it's like, these, this is no longer the right place. There, there's mismatches. So at that point, it switches to um, the local index and attempts um, to align the remaining eight bases. So now it's looking for an eight base pair match in this local index. So if you were looking genome wide for this eight bases, you would probably have like, you know, millions or I don't know, tens of thousands of matches, right? Because eight base pairs is not that big of a sequence. It's not that unique. Um, you'd have no hope. But because you've kind of anchored yourself using the global search and then extension to this local place, you have this much smaller index. So there might only be one or two eight, pair, eight base pair matches in that local index, which is like one fifty thousandth of the genome, one out of 48,000. So that's what allows you to find this nearby match and then complete the alignment and create this spliced alignment. Um, it does some other checks, and then if they kind of like make sense in terms of the the orientation of the match, like if the eight base pairs was matched, but it was in the wrong direction, that would fail, right? It has to be like eight base pairs in a like consistent direction. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. So it would probably favor um, an alignment that like matches up with the known exon, but depending on which mode you run the aligner in, it doesn't necessarily have to. It could be, it, in this case, it matches kind of perfectly with the expectation with the exon boundary, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Because we can, with this uh, aligner, we can find like, novel splice junctions, for example, or novel exon exon junctions. So it's not constrained to only alignments that like are supported by known annotations. But the known annotations can be used to kind of like guide it. Uh, I think we just have one more example. Oh, I already jumped ahead. So um, this is the example where there's kind of like um, more of an even split between the two. So again, it does this global search, trying to find one match with at least 28 bases. So this is a kind of slow process, but once it finds that 28 base pair match, um, it attempts an extension. So in this case, it can extend for about 50 bases until it starts mismatching at the 51st base. 
It then switches to that local index. So now again, we're looking for a small hit, like an eight base pair hit um, in the kind of local region. And we do find one nearby. And then with that hit, there's still more read to, to be explained. So now it switches again to an extension mode. And if it can extend that eight base pair local index hit um, to the full read, it knows that it's mapped this full kind of 50 base pair on each end alignment. So those are kind of three scenarios of how this strategy works. Basically, it uses kind of um, these logic and heuristics and knowledge of known transcript structures to, do, to come up with this kind of best educated guess of where each read aligns to in a splice aware manner. No, that's right. Yeah, it would find like all the eight pair, eight base pair matches. And if there's more than one, it would then switch to look for, um, like, I guess, larger matches. Yeah. That's a good question. Oh, sorry. He asks, what happens if the first um, 28 base pairs is split across um, like a, a boundary? Like if you can't make that first 28 base pairs. I forget what it does in that case. So I think the global search, the default global search would fail and um yeah let me research that to remind myself exactly what it does i'm sure it has like a fallback strategy where it either like goes to um like extends further like to shift the 28 base pair window over so that it could find maybe a 28 base pair match somewhere else and then extend backwards or um yeah i forget the details but it's probably it's something like that yeah, that's a good question though Yeah, try from the other end of the read. That seems like that would be a logical thing to try. Yeah, it's, that could be like the, another answer to his question about like what to do with the first 28 base pairs. I just forget the details of specifically what it does, but it's, it's probably something like that. Yes, it does it for read one, read two, at least at first, but then if it fails one read, it uses the other read to anchor and retry the failed read. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point too, yeah. Yeah, I haven't, I don't remember reading that somewhere, but I guess I do imagine like at some point for very short reads, it would start to struggle, like 30 base pair reads or something, you know, like, which would be pretty antiquated now, but yeah. I think these settings are like, these are the, these are default behaviors. So I believe you could like, you could change. So there probably is like a certain amount of tuning you could do to like change the default way that this works for a different situation, like unusually short reads or something. But with most of the reads, it would be falling within the exon, not crossing the boundary, right? Mm, most. If they're short. That's true, I suppose. Yeah, that's true. Yeah which sort of like solves the problem in one sense, like it solves this problem of like correctly placing the read, but then it hurts you when it comes to trying to actually resolve the transcript structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what do you get out of HiSAT? You get a SAM or BAM file. Uh, SAM stands for a sequence alignment uh, map format. And BAM is just the binary version of a SAM file. 
So a BAM file is basically a SAM file. Um, the difference is just that the SAM file is like plain text, so you can actually open it and read it. The BAM file is like a compressed version. It, it's like BAM is to SAM what the fastq.gz is to fastq, right? Just like a unreadable compressed version of it where you need at that point like special software to interact with it. And it reduces the size of the files like quite substantially. Like I want to say it's like one tenth the size of a SAM file. And really nobody does anything with SAM files. Um, they're just like at this point way too big. Um, everything's either BAM or CRAM. Well, a lot of stuff is CRAM now, which is like the next even more efficient uh, compression strategy for, for BAM files. 